Today starts a new chapter, chapter five, solid, where we'll try to discuss best practices in programming, specifically uh, solid practices. How do we apply them in our code base? Why is it important to know them? And how does that help us with our daily problems uh, when programming? In this chapter, we'll try to understand how to write functions that do one thing, components in isolation, classes with clear intent. We'll try to be efficient at managing complexity, um, managing dependencies. We'll also try to design for changes in mind, design our classes for changes in mind, and we'll try to figure out how to quickly spot potential issues in code and how to tackle them. And today's lesson is to understand a bit better what is solid, what is single responsibility, what causes us to violate single responsibility principle, um, how to measure single responsibility principle, how to look at code and understand if it's decoupled code, if it's clean code, if it's code that actually does one thing or not. Uh, we'll talk about high cohesion term. We'll talk about single responsibility in various levels. And we'll talk about benefits of single responsibility. Now let's go back and talk about solid. It's a collection of practices, but often a misconception about solid is that people think it's uh, uniquely applicable only for object oriented programming. Actually, the same principles apply for functional programming as well as in general design. Like you don't want to couple different components at any level, even in front end per se. Uh, a function that you tell it to do one thing should just do that one thing. And every side effect is a code smell. Every side effect is something that you potentially do not want. Um, we try to be true to our intentions and do just what is needed to be done. So there are many aspects how solid is applicable in different areas, not just object oriented programming. And solid just straightens us, moves us to the right direction in programming in general, and actually transcends even programming itself. Just design in general, solid design is good design. Um, and now let's talk about the main topic of today, which is single responsibility principle. And take a good look at this picture. Unfortunately, this is how most code looks like, especially in big projects where complexity is huge. People, um, tend to have trouble understanding the, or, or predicting the changes that will happen in the future. And when design is not uh, in consideration to changes, we actually end up with something like this, where to the same place, we keep adding things, until it starts looking something like this awful mold tool. And what does single responsibility say? It says that a function, class, or a module should have a single reason to change. And solid in general, if changes 
weren't a thing, if they weren't supposed to happen in software, if they didn't happen in software, so solid principles wouldn't matter that much. Because if something doesn't change, you can just make it work for the time and that'll be good enough. But changes is what happens in our dynamic uh, environments and that is to be naturally expected. Even if you don't have to uh, necessarily support multiple things, you should still consider that things will change and your code base needs to react to such changes. Single responsibility tries to isolate uh, moving pieces so that changes could be minimized and that we changed a single place when the changes arise. This is. Now let's talk about the problem. What causes the change? Requirements can change, so our code changes. Adding new features can change, so naturally code changes. Fixing bugs cha cha makes our code change in different ways. And of course, when we refactor code, it also changes. And hello, uh, full stack life. With every change that we deliver in our code base, we introduce a risk that a bug arises. And if we look at this picture, we see that we add a small function to perfectly working code and everything suddenly breaks. And that happens. That happens maybe not so often, but that has happened to pretty much everyone, I think, at some point in their development career where they think they know how the system works or how a function works or how a uh, class works and they try to change it. They try to add something and it breaks. And fixing it is, well, what should follow, but avoiding this situation is what we should strive for altogether. So imagine that if we have a single um, class, let's, let's call it God class or utility class or common class, where all the common functionality is stored. And here's the illusion. We might think that we understand where to look for common code, or we might think that it's easy to insert common functionality because that's just one class in one place, right? If things, uh, need to be fetched or locked or something like that. We just utilize that utility class. However, that's just an illusion that we make. In reality, nobody understands how that class actually works. It's just a collection of labeled methods that inside them, it's just a mess that nobody understands. And people are afraid to change such, such code bases. They most certainly won't be tested. And on top of not being tested, they will also simply be very hard to maintain. And if something breaks, I really have a hard time imagining someone fixing it. Like people will fix it, but the fix can either be A, a rewrite, or B, a big massive struggle of changing the existing mess. And a rewrite in that case would probably mean splitting the functionality to where it belongs logically and not semantically in one place and pretty much a garbage bin for code. Code graveyard. That's what it's also sometimes called. So the big question. Can we design our code so well so that we don't even need changes altogether? And the answer to this question, I'll say straight away, avoiding changes altogether is impossible. That's not what we strive for, 
But the thing that we strive for is minimizing them, minimizing the changes that we need to make and maximize the amount of code not written. And let's start from some examples. Here is a room. And on the left, you see a room that violates single responsibility principle because in one room, we have everything that the person needs, a bed, a bath, a fridge, a sink, toilet, and so on. Nobody would want to live in this place because first people want privacy. They want to move things around and there are just some objects that stick out and are irreplaceable uh, because that's the design choice someone made. Basically to separate something like this, you would need to build walls around it. So the problem by itself is probably too deep to fix it easily in such a room because you cannot move a toilet that easily. Same for a sink and therefore you will probably just build walls around it. That's how you might avoid it. On the right side, you see a slightly better approach. Uh, well, much better approach because each room is separated with uh, walls and you have doors as a single point of entry to access the contents of a room. So each room can represent a module and a door can represent a port or an interface through which a component exposes its contents and functionality. If we refer to a function starting from the lowest level, we can apply solid principle, a single responsibility principle for a function as well. Disregard the fact that it's a private static function that returns a list matters not so much. The important bit here is that we are trying to merge two lists together. How does a merge work? Well, I honestly would need to read the whole code, even though it's code that I wrote myself today, I would still need to scan through the code with my eyes in order to understand what's written. I would need to scan through the whole, I don't know, 30 lines of code in order to figure out what the hell is going on. And that's not really nice. What can we do better? to simplify understanding this function. Well, we can split big pieces of code that we had hard time understanding and name it. So split one big function into named steps in private functions. And now we understand how merge works. We start with an empty list. And then we say that uh, while either side has elements, while left or right side has elements in the list, uh, we move bigger element to the result. And that's how it works. How does moving bigger element work? Well, if both sides have elements, we choose the first bigger element and move that to a result. Else, if only one side has elements, we just move elements of that remaining side to the result. Actually, just one element. Because we split in two even parts, so logically only one, one element more is what the other part can have. And that's the solution. Single reason to change for a function. That's how you would refactor it for merge function. If you want uh, a full solution for this function, uh, you can find it in the link below here on the left. It's a uh, merge sort implementation. In um, a dirty approach or rather normal approach, typical approach that you would see, 
uh, in slightly naive approach to make things better and in optimal approach, not uh, optimal algorithm wise, but optimal readability wise. What conclusion can we make from such code? Well, merge is a high level concept and therefore a high level concept requires high level calls inside it or rather slightly lower level calls. And therefore the problem that we had in the function before is that it was a high level concept having very low level code in it, basically raw code in it. So high level code should not call very low level code high level, co level code should call slightly lower level code. So our high level merge concept works with a named functions that represent, uh, that represent um, our intention better. So those, uh, named labeled functions are actually slightly lower level concepts, but they're not low level concepts. When you end splitting functions to a point where it's just calling framework code, then you are uh, working with lowest level code and such code shouldn't be mixed with high level code. And this is what we see in a good example. Uh, okay. Yeah. So now let's move on to a class, a slightly higher level. And what would you say if I told you that order header creates order line or that sun changes time of a day or that book locates where it's available? This doesn't really sound right, right? So a better approach would be to separate the concerns in, into a different object that manages one thing or the other. So order shouldn't create its own line. It should, well, order header shouldn't create order line. Order, a higher level entity should add lines and add header probably from through something like order parser, order builder or similar. Sun is definitely not coupled with time itself. It just happens to um, match the pattern, but it doesn't have to be that way. So clock is something that is responsible for measuring time, not sun. Sun is just brightness measurement, day and night cycle measurement, but not time itself. And even then it's not that relevant. Clock is responsible for time. Sun is just something of nature. That's all. Book shouldn't give its own location because um, that would mean that multiple instances of books duplicate their own logic, like relocate themselves all over and over, over again. Like why would a book in a specific library know where other books in other libraries exist? That doesn't make sense. So book locator locates a certain book based on, let's say a book ID. That sounds much more logical. And the whole point of refactoring it like this is the fact that changing one no longer affects the other. That's the purpose of a single responsibility principle that you have a minimal amount of moving pieces. And single responsibility applies to project structure as well. Here we can see something common is definitely very uh, 
very familiar to most of you probably a common project where you just put common logic but it ends up being just everything and you really have no idea what you actually expect to find in common and same with vague names like infrastructure like what the hell is infrastructure uh, on the right side you actually don't even need to open uh, the common project or infrastructure po project and you immediately see the whole functionality that is exposed so you see what is actually infrastructure infrastructure is database repositories it's notifications uh, it's security uh, what is common common is validation standards it's much better clarity when we design it that way. And for the whole solution, you can, can apply this principle, but for this specific thing, you need to be very careful because if you start splitting a simple solution that is for a short term and turn it into something like this, you will hate yourself. Solid comes with a price. And this makes sense when you can pay that price for long term projects. There is complexity in long term projects and complexity needs to be tackled in long term projects. Changes are likely to happen or rather are guaranteed to happen. So a design for changes solid is what you should strive for as well. Therefore, the opposite can also be true when splitting solution too much, especially this applies, what you see here is a monolith. Let's be honest. Very often, instead of a monolith, you'll have a microservice based architecture. And if you start um, treating a simple solution from microservices based solution, and create complexity when there shouldn't be any and where, when there isn't any and when you're solving problems when where there aren't any you're actually creating problems so instead of applying solid principle in in small smaller solutions you should also consider yagni principle which states you ain't gonna need it you ain't gonna need microservices you ain't gonna need it split that way it's easier that way because it won't change that much and solid won't buy you um, enough benefit for the time that you will spend uh, designing it. So be careful with making architectural choices and design it according to the resources that you have and the scope of a project that you need to do. And one thing that is very um, mis often misinterpreted, single reason to change, single responsibility principle is most often um, a, uh, like picture it as, as if something needs to be split and people split things, over engineer things to some extent where it's actually pointless. So in this example, you can see a bad item class and tax calculator, which basically takes item price and item tax percent and calculates net price for an item. So you have a class that does nothing by itself, except that it proxies to um, item bad class and does something with it. Of course, this is bad design and of course, this should be simply morphed to the item class itself because it's a trivial calculation that item itself can manage. If, if a class can do something with itself and if that something is trivial, then a class should do it by itself. Splitting things too much is as big of a problem for solid. Um, 
single reason to change can also mean that when we change something, we change a single place as well. So if you change, if you need to change one thing and you end up changing multiple things, that's also a violation of single responsibility principle. Now let's talk about a few very important terms in single responsibility principles. Actually a, a term in object oriented uh, programming as well. So cohesion is a term where, which, which means that things stick together really well. Like it's in the right place and it's really dependent on one another. It's needed for one another. And that's what high cohesion means that things belong to the right place. And the opposite, things out of place, means that, that it's low cohesion. So high cohesion, things are in the right place. In this picture on the left, you have low cohesion. Things are out of place. You have different concepts mixed in different components. And on the right side, you have same concepts in same components. So it fits really well. And another term with this is separation of concerns. Code that isn't similar should be isolated. And similarity here is functional, not semantical. For example, interfaces shouldn't be placed in the same place. Models shouldn't be placed in the same place. Um, um, services shouldn't be placed in the same place. Uh, enums shouldn't be placed in the same place. A certain module should take different semantic parts and make a um, functional unit by itself. We should slice our system in vertical and not horizontal layers so that we can have all that we need close together when we're working with it. And this is actually a very um, misunderstood bit quite often where people focus on separating layers rather than separating modules. So modularity is the ultimate goal in software design. We want to make our system modular and nothing else matters actually. If it does what it should do and it's modular, you reach your goal as a developer to design such a system. So what does modularity mean? Again, we can see that we have uh, on the left, uh, at the top, we have two modules or two applications two classes even. And the whole point about this is that they have a single interface through which they communicate. So all the low level details are hidden from each component. For a class, this means that it's a public method and those private methods and private components are hidden. For a um, module, this means that private uh, composition uh, fields are hidden and just the public interface is what uh, exposes the functionality. For a project, this means uh, internal classes, internal interfaces that are not exposed to, to another project. And for um, a web service, this just means basically that we have we have a controller that exposes functionality and the rest is unaccessible because we have HTTP, for example, as an access point. For user interface, that means that um, we don't access anything under the hood directly. We just access whatever is relevant to the consumer, to the user. And at the bottom, you see just a mess. We wouldn't be able to figure out what is what based on the bottom picture.
So why do we need modularity? Because we can easily make changes. We can swap components or we can reuse components, modules. We can take one component, cherry pick it, put it in another system or take a component from another system and add it to our own. Modular design is a way to go for software design. That's why, um, so are people handling this well? And the answer to this is that there are many cases where you take a module and it does what it should, but when we adapt it to our own needs, we often need an adapter, but this is a whole different topic that we'll cover in way later and dependency injection, uh, dependency inversion, when we cover dependency inversion principles. So for now, all that we know about modularity is enough. Uh, don't expose more than you need and keep the related things close. Don't let them leak to the outside. That, that would be the key to modularity and expose them through some interface that is known to the outside. A code smell is an interesting term. Basically, um, in programming and software design, we have a definition called code smell. It's basically a pattern based on which we can quickly identify potential issues in our code base. And this doesn't mean that uh, the code is bad or that it needs fixing, but it just means that it's a symptom and it might need fixing. It, it, it most definitely needs more attention to just look at it and manually analyze it. That's what code smells are. It's like a warning that you should look at and figure out if you need to do anything about it. Um, there is a great website about code smells. It's like a recipe book and that is sourcemaking.com slash refactoring. An awesome website. It has illustrations and all the illustrations that I took for the slides uh, in, in the next slides are from there. It's a really cool one written in a really easy to understand way. So single responsibility violation related code smells. Let's start with long method. What are the symptoms? A method has multiple lines of code. Remember the merge method that we analyzed at the beginning? It has, it does so many things. Um, and it's really hard to understand the details of it. Like, sure, you read that it merges, but does it really merge? Does it have side effects? I don't know. It's hard to understand. And I need to read through all the details in order to get what it does. Some people actually think that treatment to such code is writing a comment, but that is a lazy treatment. And actually that's just curing the symptom, um, making it slightly more clear, but the actual treatment is just, as you can see, taking scissors and just splitting that method into parts, into named steps and clarify the intention that way. And to be more precise, split and keep similar level of abstraction methods together, high level, with high level, low level, with low level. Another thing, um, if you consider splitting a function, like if you see that it can be split, you probably should split it. Like you shouldn't even think about not splitting it. That's the usual answer to this problem. Like if you start wondering, hmm, maybe I should split it, split it. That's the way to go. It's not, uh, it's different from splitting a class because the method is going to be still in the same place. You're just um, clarifying yourself by having a named step. 
large class. So as we mentioned in the beginning, as the same point of entry where you just add, add, add functionality without considering of splitting it or adding it and elsewhere, probably because someone else did it. So if you affect the same class multiple times when different changes happen, actually I should emphasize different changes happen, then you're probably dealing with large class. What's the treatment? Similar to a method. Split it, keeping in mind high co cohesion. Shotgun surgery is a code smell that we tackled when we talked about uh, item and tax uh, calculator. So when we calculate taxes, uh, sorry, not taxes, but debt price, item itself can manage that just fine. So adding a class that manages it is just over engineering. So when a single change comes and it affects multiple classes, that is a symptom for shotgun surgery. Treatment, um, instead of splitting, merge the functionality. Sometimes maybe not into a single place, maybe into multiple places, but the fact is that the class that you have right now does too little and the parts of it or the whole thing should be merged into one or more classes. And lastly, data clumps. Uh, something very uh, familiar as well when we have a bunch of primitive fields that we're dealing with such as, let's say, um, um, name, age, weight, let's say those three fields, name, age, and weight. Hmm. Doesn't that sound like person metrics or something similar? So when you're dealing with consistently similar primitive fields of data, or when you're passing similar fields of data as parameters, you should consider uh, grouping them together and encapsulating them into a class and then referring to an instance of an object instead of a bunch of fields. So data clumps refactoring is grouping fields together into a class and referring to that class. And apparently that's it. That's all I had for this lesson. So why single responsibility principle? Because it helps you to manage changes easier and understand your code base easier. So if we want to increase maintainability, we need to put uh, tightly related things close and isolate unrelated things from the rest. That is all. Do you have any questions? Yes, um, it definitely comes with practice. Just hearing about single responsibility principle might be a lot to take in. Um, but that's the point. You hear about it, you are aware of it, and you just need to practice, 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 practice till you actually get the hang of it. and. Code smells are really a good way of um, just checking or, or challenging yourself and seeing if you can see those patterns for problems in code, for potential problems in code. All right, guys, um, then one request from you, please write one thing that you think you understood very well like the highlight of the lesson 
And one thing that maybe you would like to understand better and wasn't so clear, or like maybe you're interested in and would like to know more. I'll give you a few minutes for that and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Uh, so, Royal Offset, I think I understand the big picture, but I have to practice to understand how in real code things are working. For example, you said in folder uh, named services and models are wrong, but I do not see how do I name it better. Um, as I mentioned before, this might be wrong in some cases, this might be good in other cases. If you're making a monolith, if you're making a monolith, this probably is a wrong approach because you want to understand what modules you have. And maybe in a module itself, you would have uh, services and models and stuff, but like your whole solution shouldn't be split into just models, services, a database. Uh, so here is the example that uh, I have for painted prosthetics project. And as you can see, we have clients, common domain infrastructure here. It's literally just layers kind of, but if you open domain, you actually see what problem we solve. And if you open, um, oh, there aren't any, but if I open the CS project, you can see that we have folders for models, repository services. So my point is you can separate different semantic parts in folders, but the facing, the front facing part shouldn't be the uh, semantic layer. The front facing part should be actually a module. So that is uh, the point of a modularity that you how a module itself manages its complexity it can manage it however it wants but the layer or semantics shouldn't be the front facing thing so again here you can see that this solution has clients it's just not just backend so it has a domain and the problem that it solves is defined here and outer logic that is not um, 
coupled to the core of solution is how we manage persistence and how we do notifications. And um, we have a bunch of common stuff. So we're using XUnit with our own common things we have for our domain shared kernel and we have validation. Again, looking at this, I can understand in a big nutshell what the solution is for. And that is the end goal of programmer is to have a design that both is modular, clear, not something that just screams to you services, models, and, and so on. That just layers. It's not how you solve a problem. That's just abstractions that don't mean much. Yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to talk about today. So thank you all for the lesson and see you on Saturday. Tomorrow I won't do a lesson, I'll be going out. So see you till then. Bye bye.